Hi, welcome to the Free and Equal Network. I'm Christina Tobin, the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to broaden electoral choices through education and direct positive action for those of you who are not aware of us quite yet. Uh, we're going to be hosting our fourth United We Stand uh, this April 28th at Texas A&M. Uh, sorry, April 29th, Sunday, uh, at Texas A&M from 2 to 6 p.m. And what United We Stand is, is a solution-based movement uh, uniting students with conscious musicians, artists, and thought leaders to awaken political and cultural change. So I hope that you can check us out at United We Stand, again, Texas A&M, April 29th, because we're going to have a speaker by the name of Mr. Peter Joseph at the uh, United We Stand event. Peter, welcome to the Free and Equal Network. Oh, thank you, Christina. I appreciate you setting this chat up. And I'm glad you're uh, pushing forward with that event four years on. That's, uh, that's a good accomplishment. Yeah. I really appreciate it, Free and Equal. We've been about around for 10 years now. Uh, many of us know us from the 2012 presidential debate that uh, Larry King and I co-moderated, uh, really creating more voices and more choices. Peter, you're... You were a Wall Street guy, right, back in the day? Well, that word uh, has a lot of meanings these days. But yes, I was a private <laughs> equity trader. I didn't actually go to, to the New York Stock Exchange or anything. So I did live in New York City for quite some time, though, during that time. But yes, I spent about six years uh, learning about economics through my behavior and financial trading. It kind of brought me to where I am now in terms of my focus, which is mostly economic. Uh, that's the purpose of the Zeitgeist Movement. Ten years on, I wrote a book recently about it, about the importance of a of a sane economic system in order to have sustainability on this planet, and of course, to have improved democracy and social justice. But yeah, that is a, an odd tidbit. In fact, that I often joke. I my two industries I worked in for years, the two core industries after I got out of college were advertising and Wall Street. So I consider both of those to be terrible blights on uh, on this planet. They don't really serve positive roles. Uh, they tend to manipulate people and support mm -hmm. classist and, and in-group and generally uh, uh, it leads to a kind of uh, general bigotry in society where we're trying to game each other so much through these market-driven mechanisms. So anyway, I'm, I can keep rambling on about that, but yeah, so I have a unique history, that's for sure. I was gonna say Wall Street turned activist hardcore and uh, the Free and Equal team, what a team you guys are, all of you women out there as well. Um, we're, we're really excited to have you at United We Stand April 29th at Texas A&M. Uh, I have to definitely plug our co-host, uh, Nexus Earth. I mean, to be able to combine uh, elections and technology together really creates something unrecognizable. So I'm very excited to have Nexus Earth on our side that does like not only the cryptocurrency, uh, but will be... Uh, will be um, um, powering our election assistant app. I'll get into that a little bit later uh, with blockchain voting. So right. super, super cool. Other uh, co-sponsors well, are Presearch. What a cool, cool group going on there. Org, a column paper of Presearch. Dr. Bronner's, you know, the magic soaps. I mean, uh -huh. that's like the whole hemp base. If you've heard of David Bronner. So those are the kind of kind of people that we have supporting and many, many more. Um, with United We Stand. So that new book, it's called The New Human Rights Movement, correct, yeah, I, Peter? I can, I can hold it up. <laughs> hey, cool, yeah. The New Human Rights Movement. Oh, my goodness. I just, ha I just had to – oh, go ahead. I was just commenting that it, I look at the title and it, it just screams uh, arrogance and ambition because, you know, to define the new human rights movement, what, is that, what was the old one, people would say. And the and just to say it, uh, it's really it talks about the economic forces in our society and how they they influence people's behavior, influence groupistic tendencies and elitism. And in about one hundred and twenty five thousand words, I try to get to the bottom of it and pose some solutions. So new economic ideas, uh, more technical, technologically advanced than anything we've seen over the past 200 years, uh, building upon, of course, what you've just said regarding things like blockchain and how we can revolutionize the democratic process. Uh, I think in tandem with that, we need to start thinking about economic reforms, too. Uh, there's something about uh, a society that's completely driven by money and and the Koch brothers. And somehow we're surprised when 
money is influencing elections, like people buy a pizza, they're buying politicians and, and creating legislation. Uh, I see that uh, I see that as a, almost a, a ex something to be expected. This kind of corruption that we talk about all day long, you know. So the money in politics phenomenon, I think, goes deeper than just trying to legislate out the ability for lobbyists to do this and that. But I'm already on a tangent here, Christina. So. <laughs> well, I wanted to just engage the community there. I see Ben Holland. He looks like 30 without the beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> social know, media. I'm, not, just, I'm, I'm totally letting recognize. people know if they have questions. I need. I see you on social media. We have Peter Joseph here, Zeitgeist, uh, movie, movement, reached like, what, a couple hundred of millions, mod hundreds of millions of people. If you have any questions for him, just, you know, just put them on social media. I'll try to try to read them out to you. Um, but as far yeah. as on a tangent, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, well, the money, as some say, Koch brothers, I really go right to the powers that be, whether it's Rockefeller, Rothschilds that control this two-party, really one-party duopoly. And not only that, as we are becoming more conscious and aware through this rapid evolutionary change, I think it's on the horizon, uh, the power and influence they have of the mainstream media and, and Hollywood and and so many different factions uh, and, and, and music. Wow, what a corrupt music industry there. Uh, but a democracy, I like to go demo public, kind of like incorporating democracy, republic. I think a lot of the, the root of, uh, of, of coming together and, and really recognizing that those who say democracy, those who say republic, I think we all really want the, the same thing in the end, which is peace love over fear, peace and unity and coming together. And as far as money and politics, whew, we'll be interviewing G. Edward Griffin next week. Uh, this is kind of the pre-announcement. Uh, the expert on the monetary reserve, he'll be here on the Free and Equal Network, uh, who wrote the book, The Creature from Jackal Islands. So I couldn't believe, couldn't agree with you more how the Federal Reserve being created in 1913 simultaneously with the income tax. All of a sudden, there's all this funding through this, uh, um, this currency, the Federal Reserve, to create war and divisiveness and feeding into the greed, the powers that be that control the one-party duopoly. So I'm, I'm, I'm right there uh, ranting with you, Peter. <laughs> well, it, and I think it goes even deeper. It goes to, as I denote in my book, you go back about 12,000 years and you have the infamous Neolithic Revolution, they call it, and that's when human society decided to start irrigating and, and applying agriculture and the climate change that became more prone to agriculture. And you, you look at a map of, of human evolution and you see all these spots of agriculture start to emerge and then cities emerge. And then something happened in the process of trade and so on where specialization of labor occurs that a kind of determinism happened where we became very groupistic. So elitism became kind of part of the lifestyle, which was very different from before the Neolithic revolution where hunter gatherer tribes are actually quite egalitarian. They they would had a completely different sense of um, relationship to the planet. There was a great deal more trust. So that, you know, there's a lot of theorists and uh, anthropologists that have talked about this uh, for many decades now, but it was a, a, a severe paradigm shift. And if there's anything that I would advocate people research to try to understand where we are today is to go back to that period of time and then compare it to what we're doing today. Look at the characteristics of these civilizations that have happened before that were very, very different, completely different cultures. And then compare it to, to what's happening today and ask why. What's the difference? And that's something I explore in the book. And I kind of hope that eventually human society will return to more of a uh, egalitarian, not a hunter-gatherer society, of course. You can never go back. But if we can generate the kind of technological abundance we're capable of generating on this planet, because we know that nobody needs to be starving. There's no excuse for poverty on this planet. And, and the reason it exists, of course, is because of that built-in groupistic elitism that keeps antagonism, of course, you can use words like classism, and of course that leads to racism, you know, historical racism, especially in the United States, is really an economically driven uh, phenomenon. You know, the, the decision, for example, to have African slaves in the United States was an economic decision, of course. It's there because people wanted to save money on labor, and then you have all that strife that occurred in the early 20th century with unions and union busting and this constant class war that, um, that can, keeps us in this state. And suddenly we have a president that is literally a CEO. His entire cabinet is full of basically billionaires and people that just wanna preserve the most elitist aspects of our system. So again, I'm gonna ramble on and tangent here, but uh, so those are the kind of things I'm concerned with ultimately. And 
for example, at your event, I, I'd like to talk about some of those things and also talk about some direct democracy things uh, in terms Beautiful. of blockchain. I also I find it disconcerting, sorry to interrupt, that uh, our sense of democracy has become people standing in the streets and holding up signs and yelling at buildings. And that has had efficacy throughout time, but there has to be something new. We can't continue to pretend that the free speech zones and you know gathering half a million kids to, to talk about gun control and having them just have this expression to assume that is going to be the end or that should be the democratic process of influencing what our government does, I find to be very disappointing, as much as I appreciate the sentiment, of course. So there's, there's lots to talk about in terms of, of this, this uh, connection between economics and democracy and how to actually get direct engagement. And I think referendum-based direct democracy is the next stage of restructuring our, our, uh, our society ultimately in America. And it seems like the way to achieve that direct uh, democracy, republic, demo public, however it may be, uh, uh -huh. it's really going to be a lot easier when a beautiful solution-based uh, peaceful movement, again, level over fear rises to replace a couple hundred people targeting Congress first, because congressional races are far more key than uh, the Trump presidential races. And when you mentioned Trump, I like to focus on the positive uh, as much as I can. And I would say with Trump being elected, people are more engaged than ever. Had Clinton got elected, I think people would have gone back to being apathetic. And, and mm. secondly, he's really not, he's a bit of an outsider of the system. Uh, so having worked for Ralph Nader in 08, I would have done it for Dr. Ron Paul. Uh, he ran as an independent Nader, has his national ballot access coordinator. I spearheaded a drive, and thanks to the circulators, of course, overseeing them, they did the real hard work on the ground. We were able to achieve over half a million signatures getting on the ballot in uh, 45 states plus D.C. We didn't have enough money for all 50 states. Uh, but what I recognized from Nader in 08 and that whole team, the money behind even the Obama administration was all corporations, allegedly, or maybe there's evidence now. Uh, money was sent illegally, however, at uh, from big corporations, you know, through, through the, so there's a lot of, I don't think uh, the current president is the issue. I think it's this, maybe part of, but not the entire issue. It's the, the system. There have been so many presidential candidates prior to this one. So focusing on the good, those two things I mentioned before, people are more engaged than ever. And uh, I do foresee an, an independent movement rising with congressional ratings at an all time low and more people considering themselves independents and seeing that parties don't work. I think parties are going to fade away. Um, religions definitely. <laughs> I think there's a big spiritual evolution as well. So going right into a question though, because I, I know you guys are there. We got a couple questions from Marat. Uh, Marat I see and uh, Niels. For pretty much uh, your new movie. When did the new movie come out? The expected release date. Hmm. And maybe yeah, you want to I... kind of like let people know about it or not or well, I whatever say you that can. <laughs> well, I've, no, this has been an ongoing delay, unfortunately, mm -hmm. years delay with this production for many reasons, uh, but it's in process and I'm hoping this year will be the release. Uh, there are inhibiting factors I won't go into, but this year, <laughs> that's the best I can tell people right now. Everyone's just got to kind of hang in there um, because it's, it's a very low budget film that is going to produce a very high quality output. So being an independent filmmaker, it's very difficult. And I'm not, I did some crowdfunding, which was very appreciated, but I'm not asking for anything else. I just need to let this process unfold. So for all those waiting, uh, just keep tabs on my social media. I always post progress of what's happening with the film and I'll continue to do so. And donate a dollar or $20 or a hundred dollars. And cause I mean, the there's only some, huh? Yeah. I still have the, the crowdfunding was done through Indiegogo and it's still there. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to support, I certainly appreciate it. It will certainly speed things up. Um, Great. Well, maybe our, maybe our media guy can find that, Nate, uh, that crowdfunding link and put it in the chat would be great. So definitely yeah. supporting yeah. Peter. It's just you've put so much of your own uh, into building uh, the Zeitgeist movement. And I think so many more are going to be giving in the future. And that's what Free and Equal hopes to help expand yeah. your reach to the audience uh, <laughs> beyond of hundreds course. of millions. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> hopefully. Um, Michael Bressler has some questions here pretty much. What other projects do you have going on other than the new movie Into Reflections and 
what would have helped the process more, for example, well, we're, the funds earlier, more funds where you talked about that. What's going on with the Zeitgeist movement right now? And finally, does the Zeitgeist movement have any cooperation with other groups? And how does Peter, you uh, see the transition uh, to this going? It's Okay, so since the dawn of the Zeitgeist Movement a decade ago, it's been pretty incredible. I'll be in Germany uh, for the 10th annual Global Event Day. Yeah, will be on, yeah I know. The, what a perfect number. Uh, and so that will be uh, in Frankfurt, Germany on April 7th. So I'm preparing for that. I'll also be stopping in New York for, the, uh, for another talk, but that's beside the point. So basically, the movement's been doing great. Ultimately, there's numerous offshoots now, which is to be expected. And I think at the end of the day, we're all in a movement that's together. So this mm -hmm. isn't something where some individual group is going its own and not trying to collaborate with others. What makes the Zeitgeist Movement more fringe in perception is because we have very radical views on economic change and applying new systems uh, to understand economics, to, to org organize reality, to organize our economic behavior to be sustainable, and also, once again, try to reduce uh, this constant propensity for corruption and group to group abuse. That's really what that's what elitism is. It's groups versus groups. And we have a very serious groupistic problem out there. Uh, it just continues to be amplified. And, and the sad thing is it's going to get much worse as the ecological decline continues. So as we've read about, we have an enormous refugee crisis on the horizon because of areas that are drying out on this planet, along with areas that will be flooded. And that's going to start pushing people. It's going to start making more tension in Domestic uh, cultures uh, like the United States will just continue its wall building and so will other countries, unfortunately. And hence you have more tension, more strife, more conflict. So this is a very dubious period of time that we're in, but not to deviate too far from the question. Uh, the Zeitgeist Movement is going through some, some transitions in terms of how it's organized. We're trying to make it more autonomous, um, make it easier for people to engage and start chapters and lots of things that will be talked about at the actual event, which will be recorded and will be posted. So, but as far as collaborative things, the movement still continues, you know, as you know, Christina, it, when you're dealing with large scale change, everyone shies away. People are just afraid of that kind of stuff. They, they might enjoy the theory of it, but when you talk about economic reforms, you know, so say you, inch, you go a little bit outside of the norm of what market economics is defined as or capitalism is defined as, and everyone just jumps all over you and calls you a socialist. And then they call you a Nazi because they think national socialism, of course, somehow related to, to original concepts of socialism and all of that noise. So the, United, the Zeitgeist Movement has been, been beaten to a pulp by, uh, by most uh, press, but we still hang in there and we have a great uh, circulation of ideas and so on. And I encourage people to check out the live stream of the event that we do on April 7th as well, which will be posted. Wow, April 7th. So you guys check that out. And I definitely um, am, am oh, with you on. Oh, right. uh, I lost you. you. Oh, can you hear me? I lost oh, you. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, no, you're back now. Okay. Okay, great. You're back now. <laughs> okay, great. Well, okay. I'm sorry, what did um, you say? Well, I, I get how. Well, I, I get how. Bit of a, Echo here, so sorry everybody for that. I don't know if it's a little better now. Uh, so better now. basically, uh, so um, I, basically can you hear me, um, Peter? I, can you hear me, Peter? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, so I'm going to deal with this echo. I'm going to just go right through it. But uh, so oh, you said uh, so that people have been discussed a little bit more quiet. I think that an idea comes. An idea comes. As Dr. Ron Paul said Dr. in a Ron recent call I had with him, and I had with him and Dennis Kucinich and the founder of Nexus Earth, Colin Cantrell, Cantrell, when an idea comes, when an idea there's, comes there's nothing there's stopping, nothing it. stopping there's it. There's nothing that would get in the way. And when you look at the history of the American Revolution, for example, it only took 2 to 3 percent of the population to bring about this revolution. this revolution. And I feel that we can drop the R, that we can drop in revolution the R and revolution and go straight into rapid evolutionary change. change. Dr. Paul said many years ago, you may recall, if we're ever going to bring about revolutionary change. Can you hear me? Yes. It's a little, good. Okay. It's a little fuzzy in my end. If you're ever going to bring about revolutionary change, and I like to say rapid evolutionary change, two things would need to be involved. The youth and music. 
Hence okay. the creation of United We Stand. There have been so many leaders that have paved the way beyond the Pauls, Dr. Paul and even Bernie Sanders to Ross Perot to Ralph Nader to Dennis Kucinich to Jesse Ventura, who got elected, he says, in Minnesota for governor because he got into the debates, which is a big reason why Free and Equal Elections hosts the presidential debates, because that's one of, if not the most powerful tools the powers that be uh, uses, what's called the Commission on Presidential Debates, uh, to create yeah. this facade that there's only two right. parties. Again, really, yeah. A one party duopoly is what Dr. Ron Paul said on that call, and I couldn't agree with him more. So right. maybe times are going to get a little harder. I think it will before it gets a lot better. But it only takes that small percentage, 2 to 3%, for us to, to rise. And the timing of it, the window is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, and we can see with the, the government <laughs> – stifling free speech, what's going on with Facebook. And sure, we have these alternative outlets like Steam It, but they're planning on, I think, freezing us out of there as well. When you look at the National Defense Authorization Act, and the Patriot Act, and you look at the definition of terrorists, it says a conspiracy theorist is a terrorist. Uh, could they detain and, and make people like us that have a voice just disappear? Yes, the government's capable of doing that. Uh, are they using uh, Hollywood and the media and, of course, the media? Shame on the mainstream media, uh, which is controlled by the powers that be. Uh, are they using them to push their agenda, the music industry, dumbing us down, not using that pure 432 hertz frequency? Uh, so these are the sort of things that Green Eagle Elections and United We Stand, we're excited to have you be a part of April 29th at Texas A&M. Thank you to you, Peter, for your work. Um, we're really going to have a lot of local representation there, too, at United We Stand, because local is where it's at. Real change begins from the bottom up, uh, Mr. Ed Asner once taught me, <laughs> quoted by him. So uh, I definitely am so excited. It was really great to see you in person in L.A. this past weekend, too. Absolutely. I, I, I want to coming back. <laughs> I want mm -hmm. to comment one thing I, that I think describes what's happening right now that uh, is important that people see the synergy, and that's the fact that for the first time in American history, we have not only a plutocracy, which is a government driven by the wealthy and rich vested interests, but also a plutonomy, and that is an economy that's actually being basically driven by the wealthy mm -hmm. as well because they're the ones spending the most money. So the top five, 10 percent are spending so much money in terms of GDP that it makes the bottom 90 percent spending, hence the driver of economic growth, not not irrelevant, but greatly diminished. So with the combination of, of a plutocracy and a plutonomy, you have this vicious cycle now where the benefit, where, you know, trickle down economics, for example, becomes a, a no brainer for this kind of logic, because everyone thinks that the wealthy classes are all that matter. And in the plutonomy, that's actually true from an economic perspective. So you see this, this constant reinforcement of the elite 1%, 5% because of the synergy of these two things. And it's going to be very interesting to see how we break out of this pattern with the Trump administration and how deeply entrenched it is in business logic and business values as opposed to humane or democratic and so on. So I wanted to leave that with uh, your listeners, because I think if you think, of, you know, give that some thought, plutonomy and plutocracy at once. It's never occurred in uh, U.S. history. So we're in a very unique spot, as you've pointed out. And things probably will get worse before they get better. But uh, everything runs its course. So, well, we'll I, I think happens. it will, will be. But uh, I think that uh, the people will rise. And again, when that idea comes, uh, there's nothing stopping it. And I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And the realist in me is that that window is getting a lot smaller than I thought. But after going to uh, uh, visiting and, and seeing Anarchapulco a couple months ago and seeing G. Edward Griffin there, it became apparent to me that the need for United We Stand to be held in <laughs> April 29th was, was more than ever. It was too risky to wait any longer. So. Uh, yeah. that's, that's thanks for those thoughts. I have a very good question here. I just have to, I cannot ignore it because this guy I've been hearing about a lot. Uh, thank you, Martins. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts on Jordan B. Peterson? That's a guy that I definitely want to have speak at United We Stand, if not April 29th, 
we are going to evolve into a university tour because we know universities is where we need to do a lot of fixing for sure, reaching out to the youth. Well, not to be contrary, but I'm not a I'm not a Jordan Peterson fan because he doesn't take a proper sociological perspective or a structuralist perspective on human behavior and the organization of human society. And his writings fall back on very primitive, socially Darwinistic, Malthusian, hierarchical views of human relationships, meaning basically in support of elitism by some kind of biological determinism, uh, cruelly speaking. So, you know, I'm not going to, you know, there's, everyone has positive things they can contribute to this discussion that are thoughtful. But when things turn into ideologies, uh, that's when it becomes dangerous. And I think there's some characters out there that are writing about society and they get some things right. And then they get some things so wrong that it just keeps the spiral of confusion out there. Uh, sociologically speaking, and in fact, sociology itself, the idea of the synergy of everything that's happening, having its effect, and then you start to think about what is having stronger effects on human behavior and culture versus other things. This is an important conversation because if, and this is actually a good part of my book, if you understand the structure of society that's incentivizing people, motivating them to do this and that, to become elitist, to become groupistic, to become bigoted, if you begin to understand what's driving that, then you can change that condition to stop that behavior. And that's a kind of, uh, it takes a humbleness for the human psyche to kind of relinquish your sense of free will and volition to recognize that you are a part of something larger and it is having an effect on your behavior. And it's almost a paradox in terms of consciousness. So again, I talk about that a great deal in the book. Jordan B. Peterson, he, he misses all of that. And I think it's a very critical thing to be discussed, but we could debate uh, those issues another time. <laughs> I, I love your, that's a lovely answer because that's like our platform uh, free and equal as a 501c3. We don't take a stance on one or the other. We welcome these ideas. And I think it's right. so vital. That there just tells me right now, it's so vital for you and Jordan to connect. Cause I think that, uh, through communication and that connection, we're going to, again, realize that we have a lot more in common than not and learn from each other because the Peter Joseph mind and the Jordan B. Peterson mind and, and, and more and more. Oh, my goodness. Imagine you coming together on a symposium panel. And that's definitely something we'll be doing here at Free and Equal as well. We're holding our fifth annual uh, symposium, electoral reform symposium this November in Colorado. Right. Welcome you to be a part right. of that, too. Well, that's <laughs> Peter. Oh, go ahead. That was the old saying. <laughs> if, if we all agreed, there would be no progress. So I, everyone has to kind of, I mean, <laughs> that doesn't mean that the pluralism of our reality, meaning that the despair beliefs, everything deserves the exact same attention, of course. Uh, we have lots of people out there that believe ludicrous things. Uh, and you see this amplified with the kind of Trumpistic reality and the, the decry of fake news and the People dismiss ideas now just because they don't fit their ideologies and so on. But yes, uh, I won't go on that tangent. But yes, obviously, uh, disparate views can find resolution if people are being objective. And I'm always open to those conversations. But being so humble, tangent, not at all. So the, the Trump and the Clinton and the Bush and the Obama and, and, and more and more. Um, I'm curious, Peter Joseph, how do you feel about Bernie Sanders? Bernie is the best out there. There's no question that he takes the proper sociological view. He's superimposing simply policies that have existed, that do exist in other nations, like the Scandinavian nations, some of the happiest, healthiest, most sustainable nations on the planet. And it's common sense what he's trying to put forward in the same way that FDR put forward regulations and so on to collar effectively capitalism. It's just common sense that that needs to be done. And, I, and Sanders is right there trying to do that. I mean, I could Put, make plenty of critiques about that, frankly, not going far enough or not recognizing certain root issues that I think should be recognized. But uh, I, I think people should learn an important lesson about the Sanders, the Sanders of uh, him being screwed in the election and Democratic primaries. It goes to show that even those that are making common sense uh, propositions about what we can do to improve, reduce class inequality, the three people that have more wealth in the bottom 50 percent, all that stuff that we can do to collar that can't even get through right now. That's how behind the United States is. It's in such a strange position that even the most common sense social policies and safety nets are being completely ridiculed and thrown out. And Sanders didn't even stand a chance. All the forces like a swarm of business power, effectively elitist business power just came in and made sure that everything was rigged against him. 
Uh, it's almost like a natural force in a way. You know what I mean? It's not even like a conspiracy. It's just a, an, an intention that people with, with high business power associations, they put out there and then they just work against and they demean and diminish anyone that's trying to do something different. But then, again, that's another <laughs> phenomenon. But uh, I, I hope Sanders uh, continues to plug away because his symbology and his way of speaking is getting through to the youth. And I think that's that's very yeah, relevant. That's a good point. And what's what's the common denominator between Sanders and Ron Paul and Nader and Perot and all the people I I mentioned is that they aren't controlled by the powers that be. I may not personally agree with all their viewpoints, uh, uh, but sure. I do see that they're expressing what they believe in, and that's an important uh, common denominator as far as Ron Paul and the rigged system. A friend of mine, hey Paul and Jasmine, out in Anarchapulco. Uh, he went up to Dr. Paul and said, Dr. Paul, I have one question for you. I'll try to get this right. Do you think the election was stolen from you? And Dr. Paul paused and looked at him and said, of course it was. <laughs> so we go to the rigged components of the electoral system from the fact that uh, for ballot access in 98, I first saw my father who ran for governor as a libertarian. I've always been an independent. Uh, he was wrongfully knocked off the ballot. He was at the peak, uh, and uh, I recognized that why do libertarians and third parties and dependents have to get five times more signatures, 25,000 signatures for registered voters to get on the ballot? And uh, the echo came back again. I don't know if you have a browser open there, Peter. And this is what it is, so we'll go, we'll go through it. Uh, but um, uh, I recognize uh, that the system will stop at nothing to stop knock nothing, accountable stop candidates off the ballot. The and then beyond that, the uh, presidential uh, debate, the voting machines, the voting machines that, that, are, that are controlled by the powers of these, the powers of these, the powers of these people have sold the dominion. That's scary. That's scary. Uh, to, uh, so to, I, I completely agree. It's like a most flimsy uh, state the most flimsy management of the elections you could come up with has to be by design. Anyone can hack these machines. In fact, I want to encourage people to watch a show I did. The first episode, the show was called Culture in Decline. And the first episode is called What Democracy? And it goes through, uh, you know, all the things that have happened from gerrymandering to, uh, to of course, the voting machines and how easily hackable they are, uh, along with um, all the things that you brought up earlier uh, in terms of uh, the Commission on Presidential Debates and the, the rigged two-party system. So if anyone wants to know my views holistically, there's a 30-minute program that I produced about that called What Democracy, Culture and Decline. That's a funny kind of satire show I had. So anyway, I just wanted to state that because I think it's a good expression. Uh, we had another, uh, I think that. Uh, I'm going to try to get off the headset here. I'm going to try to get off the headset here because it's so bad. Yeah. It's any better. Can you hear me, Peter? Uh oh. Yeah, you got feedback happening, I think. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's very of technology. technology. All right. So I. I All right. So I, I, yeah. Still, yeah. still pretty. Still, uh, still pretty. Uh, so somebody commented, so wrote, somebody Ron, commented like, wrote, 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 from earlier in our interview, from look here, earlier, just holding back here, his tongue and tongue on this tongue on this uh, this lady. They uh, said she this lady, lady, they lady said talking she about music will change the world. Change the world. <laughs> and he Griffin says, Is it realistic? Is it realistic? We can think. bring about a mass movement under the current system. Collapse high from the UK. I'm from the UK. We'll wrap up the interview soon, we'll but there's so many interview. questions, Peter. I'm, I'm Peter. not sure if I completely understood what the question was. Um, can music change the world? Is that the question, or do we think that well, can the system... somebody was, was somebody kind of making fun, fun of you, like, that, like that you had tongue on the... Holding back your tongue on the... Maybe about music will change the world. Well, let's look at anything that happens culturally. It's a synergy of things, and I've I'm an artist. I've had my whole life, at least half of my life, was centered in classical music and performance. And I've also been very influenced by, by that kind of communication in my value system, as I think many people have. And I think the arts have a way of kind of sneaking behind the ego. That's why the Zeitgeist Media Festival that we have almost every year, 
Uh, we're trying to get one together this year as well, but that's why we do it. We try to mix the arts and the and political and social, social messages. messages. But that's of course that's not the only thing. We, we also have the also main event, 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 and that's the one that will be in Germany, which is all intellectual, all proposing uh, design changes to our system and so on. So you know, everything everything's a synergy. You never really know what's gonna what's gonna plant that seed in somebody's mind to become the next leader, so to speak, become someone that really wants to strive forward and make that change. So we have to be open to all avenues of communication, because that's what it's about. It's about communication and finding common values and common ground. And I think the arts have a very powerful role. I've, I wrote again that book, it's just a big giant academic treatment. And I find that sometimes in conversation through more gestural means, hence my film, I actually have better results with people's values and the way they're willing to accept new ideas, as opposed to just beating them over the head with sourced literature, which some people just aren't as receptive, receptive to that anymore. So it's a mix. You have to try to find all avenues and get them in alignment in terms of influencing people. Right, and then Lee, you asked, is it realistic that we can bring about a mass movement for change before the current system collapses? I just gotta jump in on that one and say, absolutely. Is that window of time getting smaller? It is, but we still have, yeah. uh, the chance well there's no that. choice yeah there's no okay. option you can't even, an option yeah even if the scientists came forward and and said that it's over <laughs> and there's no way you're ever going to recover humanity from the damage that you've done to this planet uh it, even if that was said it, sh it doesn't change your motivation to survive it doesn't change your motivation to keep this species going as a general evolutionary imperative so uh, I, I, of course, take in lots of negative information in terms of, you know, trying to highlight all the flaws, all the problems, all the all the problems that have been created uh, ecologically and socially and how they'll merge together. And it's a very bleak picture by about 2050. Um, it doesn't take much to start reverting, say, a lot of the human rights and social justice that we've been able to create because we've had a slightly more uh, balanced, uh, materially balanced society. There's been, we've had high productivity economically in material terms. Distribution is very poor. We still have pockets of poverty, but things have generally gotten better. And they will most definitely not continue to get better. And they will definitely revert uh, if the current crisis ecologically and its its influence socially goes unabated. So I'm, I'm big into that kind of environmental determinism, meaning that people can talk about morality and ethics and what they're willing to do or not do. But once survival pressure hits, uh, it's going to get ugly really fast. And the United States, uh, I don't think it's going to be able to maintain its stranglehold on this planet much longer. So in time, uh, the other systems of power are going to have to come to fruition. And I, I think, frankly, there's going to be a, a country that decides to do something very, very different. And if it's allowed to do so and build in high technology, abundance producing mechanisms, uh, we can set a new standard of what society is supposed to be. And again, I write about this extensively. That's also part of the plot of my film. So new standards can be set and then society can be begin to evolve out of all of these terrible traditions that we currently have. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my, uh, my broad scheme hope. But obviously if the whole planet is at stake right now, which it is environment, ecologically, excuse me, uh, everyone should be motivated to try and do something. And that's what stuns me when I meet people. They, people just still sit back and they have their family and their kids and their job and they just pretend everything's okay. And it's not okay. And I hope uh, people that sit back at that kind of complacency do snap out of it. And, <laughs> and just coming back to the United We Stand, it, there's no more complacent population on the planet than the United States population. This is a spoiled population that has been driven on the backs of colonization, globalization, robbing the global south to create enormous wealth in the west, concentrated now in the ultimate power empire, the United States. And the general population, you know, you see this, the outcry doesn't happen when it needs to. It happens over more petty things, not petty, but things that aren't, they don't spark anything in terms of uh, structural shifts, in terms of policy shifts. It's just a kind of outrage we have. Meanwhile, we're distracted by the president and his porn star relationship like a TV show. No one's thinking about all the terrible things happening through legislation, economically, the tax cuts. There, you'll see like a little bit of outcry here and there, but nobody. People should have been in the streets protesting those tax cuts instantly. And millions of people should have been in the streets. Instead, they go to the streets for other important, but yet in the long term, trivial things. 
Uh, anyway, I talk a great deal about that, but the United States. um, Yeah. The, um, and some people commented, maybe if you turn your volume down a little, Peter, I just saw that. And uh, they said, if you have a headset, even better, but definitely volume down might help us. Thanks everybody. I just saw that. Apologize. I didn't see it right away. And I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And I agree about having that country that sets the precedent, right. Of how things should be. However, I had a volunteer right. recently by the name of Ryland I talked to the other day, and um, he talked about how you want to build something beautiful outside of uh, the U.S., and I really, really um, believe and feel strongly that the whole world is watching the United States of America, and when we rise together, one nation, and in a peaceful, positive, not only music and the, again, the 432 hertz, like, and synergy, but also the thought provoking leaders like yourself and many in Hollywood and music on the stage of, of musicians, that is, and on a stage together through a tour. Um, when that happens in the United States of America, I feel the whole world will follow. We are it. Because if this world were to crumble, the whole world would go down with it. And I agree with you. That is not an option. I had a young female come up to me once and say, oh, what you're doing is so impossible. How could you do this? And then and it was a liberty kind of whatever event for the world. And I looked at her and there's dozens of these young faces around me. And I said, then why are you here? Because the moment that you give up, you become a part of the problem. And that is what the system wants. And I can tell you from my heart that I will not give up. I will keep going and I hope everybody that's listening today and the supporters of Peter and of course Peter um, recognize that we cannot run away from America because if we run away and things don't rise the way that they uh, historically are destined to have to here in the US because again, the latter's not an option, then those problems are going to follow you into those other countries. So that's something I really, uh, really feel strongly about. There's no doubt that because of because of the empire status of the U.S., it, it serves as a paternal figure. And you've seen uh, even just the election of Trump, you see cultural differences start to happen throughout the world because they're seeing this whole new level of immaturity. So you're absolutely right. The effect of U.S. policy as the effect of the U.S. general disposition it's exceptionalism. It sets a new, it sets a, a um, for lack of a better expression, it sets a, I can't think of a word for it. It basically sets the tone of what the general public out there uh, across the world or nationally is, is doing. And it changes other governments' policies. So you're absolutely right. The United States is a focal point. I'm actually going to talk about the United States as a, as a kind of anomalous thing, as, as, as the ultimate case study. I consider it uh, I consider it as a forbidden experiment in class dynamics and the extremes of business power. And it serves as kind of the symbol of everything else that can go wrong on this planet. But um, anywho, I think uh, the United States, if we can get reforms in the United States, it will definitely set a new precedent for other changes around the world. Though I will, I will say that if you look at other nations like China, as much as there are problems in China, they're actually starting to revolutionize, say they're, uh, economic infrastructure, their their industrial infrastructure, far more rapidly than the U.S. is doing in terms of carbon footprints and so on. So it might very well be that Europe and, and other nations and Asia uh, and China, excuse me, will be the ones that lead, say, the ecological revolution, because the United States is so far behind on any of its renewable platforms and so on. But once again, you're right, the culture of the United States is very, very influential after all these decades of globalization and empire. We'll get close to wrapping up. I appreciate your extra time for this. Uh, Fixing the system from within is so key. Uh, Free and equal elections, we believe strongly in that. As far as our co-hosts, as well as our co-hosts, Nexus Earth, check them out. Totally cool, Uh, really stands for what's right from what I can see. Um, cryptocurrency, uh, decentralizing from the system, nexus means interconnected, uh, but we must fix the system, I feel, from within. Uh, I, I feel that if we are trying to build something on the outside, the system may uh, thrive off of alternative currencies like Bitcoin, which is really feeding into the one world currency. Now that you see big money in control of Bitcoin, though I love the idea of 
alternative currency, also known as Cryptcoin, but crypt, uh, crypt, crypto that is, <laughs> Cryptcoin. And so, um, so I definitely think that, um, or if the system were to collapse, China would probably come in and scoop up America right away. So those, both of those, letting the, the, the seed of the system grow the way it is by trying to build something outside, too risky. No, thank you. I think it could come back stronger than ever, uh, which is why the need for a movement to rise, it, it must happen very, very soon. And somebody also mentioned, does Peter think that a leaders need to bring about all this together? But I love how, um, that's a question from Michael, but I love how Justin Joseph on there responded, no, a leaderless movement, we are the leaders. And you're so right, Joseph, we are the leaders. You, me, Peter, Ralph Nader once said, a true leader creates um, more leaders, not followers. And I hope to be a leader that can help elevate the volunteers that come our way. The Free and Equal Core team are all leaders themselves. Um, but to help uh, uh, build that synergy of more, more leaders, not only throughout the United States, but the world. The U.S. has got to be first. <laughs> yeah. And a leader is really just somebody that starts to that starts something. That's all a leader needs to be defined. Someone that <laughs> And then the values and the platforms should be shared by everyone, and then everybody is motivated in the same way. It's kind of a holographic view of society. And I just want to say one final thing before we end. In terms of, you mentioned cryptocurrencies. Uh, I, you know, in terms of money and stuff, there are improvements that can be made. But the real beauty of what's happening with blockchain is it allows for decentralization and the possibility of decentralizing just about every facet of society, breaking this hierarchical corporate structure that we've had, uh, well, for since we can remember. But, you know, in true uh, system science, things are interweaving and non-linear. And that's how I think society will eventually evolve to to override the, the oppressive powers in our democracy when things become isolated, connected, independent, and autonomous, but yet still sharing the same environment and still networking within that. But the greatest degree of autonomy we can have as an individual, as uh, even your home, think of your home if it was completely off the grid. It's autonomous, it's self-contained, it's highly efficient in that capacity, but yet it's still in the environment. So point being is that we need to establish new systems of decentralization that, that as long as people are sharing the environment properly and it's networked properly, a whole new paradigm of, of the way we organize, the way our economy works, the way our democracy works can be and be created. Um, anyway, that's a big conversation. So it's something else maybe I can bring up in terms of uh, the talk I'll be giving at United We Stand. And I fortunately do need to go now, Christina, but I Glad appreciate your time. You. Thank you, Peter. Did you have any last plugs for uh, your book, website, anything I, that's coming up? I just, I recommend the book. I think uh, the book has took so much time to put together and it, it embraces pretty much everything that I think is important in theory and in and in solutions. So if anyone wants to check out the new human rights movement, I very much appreciate that support. Thanks for your time, Peter. We'll see you at United We Stand at Texas A&M on April 29th, uh, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, uh, the world will know peace. Thank you, Justin Bailey, for that comment. It's very true. All right, yeah. much love to you. Thank you for all the great work you do. And thank, uh, thank you for putting up with my passion. It really <laughs> get very passionate oh, sometimes, but always I'm inspiring. Eager thank to you. learn so much more from you. All right, take care, Peter. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>